Can we start? Yeah, just wait a minute. We let people join in. Yeah. Maybe one minute. Huh? Can we start? Yeah, just, no, wait, 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 wait. just wait for it. Let, let people join in. Yeah. Maybe one minute. Huh? I think there is a disturbance. Yeah, I think so. Some... Hmm? That's not a thought. Okay. 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 I think we should start now, right? What do you think, uh, Shafi? Yes, we can start. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Respected Chief Guest of the Day, CA Atul Kumar Gupta, Past President, ICA India, keynote sp speaker of the session, Ms. Safiya Hasim Al Safi, Director, Anti Money Laundering Department, Ministry of Economy, speakers of the evening, Mr. Narsimha Das, who is going to talk about anti money laundering and on GCC attacks. From MMGS CA Surender Jastani, Mr. Hannas Halei, Mr. CA Rishabh Tandon, and CA Zeja. Uh, Past Chairman, Sponsor Delegate, Professional Colleagues, Committee Members. A warm good evening to each and every one of you. I'm Krishnan, I'm the General Secretary of Abu Dhabi CA Chapter. On, um, on behalf of Abu Dhabi CA Chapter, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all for the event today. The event is going to be on the initiative taken by UAE on anti-money laundering initiatives, GCA, GCC tax, including Oman VAT and other tax structure which affect the relationship between UAE and the other GCC countries. We are born with the response on the registration of members for this event. More than close to 200 members have been registered for the event. More and more members will join soon for the event. The speaker is going to talk about on the anti-money laundering, each and every aspect of anti-money laundering, what as a chartered accountant, what we should do, what are the initiatives we have taken, we have to take, and a knowledge session on the GCC tax and VAT. Being a chartered accountant and custodian of a finance department, it is our duty and uh, it is our duty to learn each and every aspect of the law so that we can cascade the same to our management which will be benefit for the organization and also for the UAE government. The UAE uh, anti-money laundering uh, law is, is to combat money laundering practices and they're establishing a legal framework that support the authorities concerned on anti-money laundering law and also crime related to money laundering. I don't want to take much of your time. We have a quite busy schedule today. Without taking any further time now, I hand it over to see Neeraj chairman of the chapter for further proceeding. Over to you, see Neeraj. Thank you, Krishnan. Good evening, viewers. Uh, we have a uh, good news that uh, the vaccination is again open for everyone. Uh, after, I think, six weeks break, uh, we just got an announcement, uh, I think, last day, yesterday or day before. Uh, so my request to every all the members that uh, you know that we had a tie-up with our partner, Burjil Hospital, for vaccination. And uh, we have knew that again because uh, this, was, this is controlled by the authorities. So we are in, in the agreement with the week, arranging the agreement to again start that. And as soon as we have the confirmation, we'll send out a circular to everyone and then please take appointment and start getting vaccination again. It is very important and to safeguard, this is probably the only way uh, one should uh, definitely consider having getting vaccinated. I hope everyone is keeping safe and doing well. Uh, we have a privilege today to hear our immediate past president, the Atul Kumar Gupta ji, who had a remarkable one year at the helm of affairs at ICI India and did many wonders during the tough COVID times. Uh, he, I 
hope in his talk he will cover his top few achievements uh, which is great for all the chartered accountants to be proud of uh, we have a very special guest today it's uh, safaya hashim al safi she's a director of anti money anti money laundering uh, department in ministry of economy and uh, she she is very proactive and a very going forward personality uh, as soon as i got connected with her within 10 minutes everything was done it she never came back saying that ah let me let me see if i have time but she was very quick in answering yes i have 10 15 minutes today evening no problem confirm i'll i'll speak to guys uh, the, the approach that she had but is remarkable i mean this is what uh, we would like everyone to be uh, when when you have to deliver something go on top of it do your best and deliver it thank you safiya ma'am uh, welcome all the speakers uh, to address uh, our two sessions on anti money laundering and gcc taxation we try to broaden our horizon beyond abu dhabi and it is the learning is beyond abu dhabi now so we have sent out a message to all our gcc members also and probably there will be few who will be attending today's event as it is such an interesting one which covering gcc taxation uh, our managing committee is trying to engage and uh, with each stakeholders whether it is members Sponsors, well-wishers, families. We are doing webinars and social events. We have planned a couple of uh, PDC event and uh, some social events are also in pipeline, which will be related to soon to all the members. I welcome you all to this virtual CPE meeting and request everyone to be safe and follow all the guidelines and take care. So over to you, Shafiq, to take care for the proceedings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Niraji. Assalamualaikum. Good evening, everyone. Hope everybody is safe. Uh, this is the first PDC event of the new committee, and we are privileged to have uh, our immediate past president, the CEO Tul Kumar Gupta Ji, and also uh, Ms. Safiya Hashim Al uh, Safi uh, from Ministry of Economy. Uh, what a privilege to have in the first event. So I know Atul Kumar Gupta Ji doesn't require much of introduction, but as a protocol, let me formally invite uh, introducing. is a man with astute intellect quick understanding and sharp vision siyadul kumar gupta is the immediate past president of institute of chartered accountants of india he has served the profession for about two decades uh, ca atul kumar gupta has been a member of various committees prominent committees constituted by the governments and regulatory authorities uh, ca gupta ji has authored many relevant books and has published numerous articles and delivered lectures more than 1500 seminars and conferences he is also the first chairman of the accounting and finance service sectional committee constituted by the bureau of indian standards thank you over to you adil kumar gupta ji uh thank you uh, shafiq bhai and uh, respected uh, chairman of uh, our abu dhabi chapter of icai ca neeraj ji and uh, all the management committee members madam uh, safia hashim and uh, the all the distinguished speakers a very good evening to all of you and uh, thanks to the abu dhabi team for this wonderful opportunity to address all my colleagues in the abu dhabi and as being rightly mentioned and uh, though i don't uh, like uh, know whether i deserve that kind of a words or not but uh, we tried our best in spite of the corona pandemic and i used to say that uh, in spite of the there was a lockdown but the corona or the covid 19 could not knock down us and we try to serve the profession to the best of our abilities um, as far as the various reforms are concerned i will not take much time because we are here to discuss the two very very important topics on the anti money laundering and the vat at the uae but uh, to share you uh, maybe the tips of the ice that uh, whether it was a student member or taking the profession at the global level we tried our best to see how we can transform and the journey of transformation should continue so as far as the students are concerned starting from the creating a 100 crore rupees specially scholarship funds for them even starting the virtual classes where more than 500000 students participated in the virtual classes without any charge we conducted the exam in spite of the uh, it was a global uh, benchmark when we conducted the exam in spite of the challenges in more than 1100 centers with eight countries the starting of the industrial training portal extending the period of industrial training from 12 months to 18 months special discount for the students and at the same time for the members there are number of initiative taken by the ici in the last 12 months 
may it be the vcare facilities the ca benevolent fund the special scheme for the support to the members who are sick because of the covid 19 the new networking guidelines mdp guidelines the recognition from the ugc are the few initiative taken by the icci as far as the global front is there as i i was mentioning in the pre session of the uh, this particular program that the today icci is not only available in the 43 countries but also launched the international curriculum along with the various initiative at the global front we have the uh, we also worked very closely with the government whether it may be the rebooting of the msme is there or the implementation of the gst in the country as far as the uh, our uae is concerned and the today's topic is there i will just touch upon the two topics as a uh, like because i got this opportunity and uh, as far as the uh, this anti money laundering is there which was introduced in 2018 with a federal decree uh, to counter the financing of the terrorism and to develop the legislation and the legal structured with the international standard i am aware that the cabinet uh, there was a cabinet decision in 2019 by virtue of that the ministry of economy is handling that particular aspect uh, with creating the executive office in december 2020 i am also aware that there is a national committee with the name and nam lcftc uh, who is working on the financial intelligence with the united nation drugs and the crime aspect is there and the, there is a favoritic uh, which is being developed uh, the fanr uh, but uh, uh, as far as the uh, my experience about the anti money laundering uh, is concerned in the country it is one or the other jurisdiction i will just suggest to madam and to our honorable speakers that uh, in case we want to see that uh, uh, the uh, the effectiveness of the money, anti money laundering aspect is there so not only we need to inculcate the best international practices in our system but also i will just touch upon the four mantras that okay that will be useful for the anti money laundering aspect in the uae as well the one is the data analytics so as you as being man, rightly mentioned by the world economic forum that by 2022 there will be 133 million new jobs will be there and on the first category the first steps uh, it was the data analytics so more the data analytics will be used more the artificial intelligence will be deployed into the data which is being captured by one or the other way the better anti money laundering measures will be there the another one is about the coordination committees because today we have the vat which is being applicable in country uh, maybe uh, soon the dt will be applicable so more the coordination committee between the various regulators will be there so that one computer speaking to another computer so you are sharing the data you are a, you have a common pool of the data the better will be the analytics and the data, the results will be i will be like a will be much much better as compared to the uh, normal circumstances when we are getting some, something filed by the ssc and then we are reviewing the data so uh, my suggestion to madam safia hashim will be that in case we can uh, have a coordination committee between the various regulator and the stakeholders when the computers will be speaking to each other rather than the person then there will be more and more use of data analytics and the better result of the in the uh, space of the anti money laundering will be there apart from that as i offered that the icii can be helpful to inculcate the best international practices into this particular domain so any time you feel that we should be inculcate in, we should be initiating some research document we should be doing some research on this particular aspect then we will be there to support this endeavor of the our uae government now coming to the vat aspect because the vat is a old subject and i believe that uh, uh, we have all the uh, like a uh, uh, intelligence and all the like a uh, ecosystem which is already working on the vat uh, particularly when it was introduced on the 1st of january 2018 with a 5% rate with a decree and the cabinet decision in 2017 and 18 respectively i just wish to touch upon that in the vat also right now we are only complying with the like like a, we have to pay the vat at the rate of 5% and we are filing a monthly or a returns or the annual returns as the case may be but the time will come when there will be the challenges as far as the maintenance of the itc register that is input tax registers uh, whether we are properly maintaining the same or not when there will be a vat audit by the department in the times to come or some scrutiny will be there how we are complying with the various provisions how the vat data is getting reconciled with the financial inform financial uh, uh, statements or the direct tax or other uh, regulators is something that we need to uh, uh, understand and then there will be a litigation 
so my request to all my members who are participating in this program that the regular compliance is one side but understanding that what will be the nitty gritties and the various litigative issues which will emerge in the times to come because the vat is there in the 164 countries from since 1953 and it is being witnessed by every jurisdiction that gradually and gradually the litigative issues will start emerging and then there will be a challenge for the professionals and the other assessees uh, to comply with so that is something that we need to develop our capacity we need to reskill our skills in such a way that we can provide a value added services in the overall ecosystem so this is all from my side my best wishes to the neeraj ji for the first program on this new management committee and giving me this opportunity and all my colleagues uh, for a wonderful uh, evening to all of you have a very happy learning to all of you thank you very much thank you so much uh, azul ji it's definitely our honor and pleasure to host you today uh, and thank you for sharing the achievements the key achievements during your tenure and also for the four mantras uh, for uh, aml initiatives once again thank you so much now let's move on to a very special person who is with us today um, who is spearheading the whole department of anti money laundering within the ministry itself it's none other than safia hashim al safi uh, uh, safia uh, hashim al safi is the director of anti money laundry department at ministry of economy she joined uh, ministry of economy last year and she established the new department of aml within the ministry she is leading the supervision process on designated non financial business and professions that is dnf pbs she has a master degree in islamic economics and wealth management also certified in international wealth management and investments since 2017 it's an honor to have you ma'am over to you yes please okay uh, thank you for this uh, nice uh, introduction uh, actually uh, today is my anniversary in uh, ministry of economy and very happy to celebrate it with you guys congratulations um, uh, <laughs> yeah thank you thank you it's really new and we started during uh, the beginning of the pandemic and uh, in uh, especially when this started of quarantine so it was a big challenge but now we are here we are live we are sharing with you and we are uh, now public with the private sector so um yes uh, we can start uh, actually i have a presentation if you allow me to share my screen sure you can share the screen yes okay. so it's uh you can see my screen there yes, yes we can see okay. you can make it uh, full size yeah maximize thank you okay so uh today uh, i'm going to talk about the role of ministry of ministry of economy as a supervisory body for the nfps the nfps is uh, a new uh, um, phrase for designated non financial businesses and professions and uh, they are also uh, specified in the cabinet uh, position and also in federal law number 20 as an intro introduction um, as you know ministry of economies are uh, having uh, the or carrying on the projects of um, general development plan of the state um, economically and also as uh, identifies the stage and annual divisions for all matter association to uh, such project legislation and uh, proposal and also uh, now uh, ministry of economy has been appointed as a supervisory body for uh, designated non financial businesses and professions for legislations um, regarding aml and cft uh, aml is anti money laundry cft is combating uh, terrorism finance uh, you will hear it a lot AM, aml and cft uh, combating financial terrorism uh, so you can see on the screen the main uh, uh, legislation we have uh, the first uh, one is federal Degree Law Number Twenty of Two Thousand Eighteen on Anti Money Laundering and Combating the Financing of Terrorism and Financing of uh, Illegal Organizations. 
We have also uh, the cabinet decision number 10 uh, of two, uh, 2019. And this is uh, very important uh, for implementing the regulation of degree number 20. It's mentioned uh, there. You can find all the procedures, all the requirements uh, in details for uh, designated uh, non-financial um, businesses and professions. We have also uh, cabinet uh, resolutions number 3.1 uh, and 24.4 for 2000. 19 and this is um, the regulation where the appointed ministry of economy and other supervisory bodies uh, to be um, supervising uh, entities uh, we have also uh, newly uh, uh, issued uh, in uh, last uh, august 2020 the cabinet decision number uh, 58 regulated the beneficial owner procedures we have cabinet decision number 74 of 2020 regarding uh, terrorism list regulation and implementation of uh, uh, UN Security Council. We have also cabinet decision number 16 of 2021, which is newly issued like two weeks back. This is regarding the unified list of violations and administrative fines that fall for all uh, violators uh, of anti-money laundry, uh, which is uh, fault uh, or supervised by Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Justice. Uh, this, um, this cabinet decision is still in Arabic and it's in process of its translation. Once it's translated, it, it will be uh, posted uh, and also uploaded in the Ministry of Economy website. Okay. As I said, um, we are uh, now a new uh, supervisory body, but also we are a member in uh, the National Committee, uh, National Committee of Anti-Money Laundering and Compassion Financing of Terrorism and Financing of Illegal Organization Committee, which Mrs. Kopta just uh, mentioned. Uh, this is the phrase of it, N-A-M-L-C-F-E-C. And uh, this committee is served and enhance all effectiveness of AML and CFT framework in UAE. And uh, it's also ensuring uh, the continuous of international standard related to combating our anti-money laundering and CFT. Uh, also, um, there are some uh, subcommittees under this uh, also we will I will show how it's the structure. Uh, there are um, six subcommittees and the national committee, and each subcommittee has its own role and also have uh, different members uh, and re uh, relevant entities. Uh, also, Ministry of Economy, uh, as I said, is the advisory body of all uh, DNFPPs and. Um, but also we have uh, lawyers the lawyers and notary publics are under ministry of justice uh, supervision uh, most of the supervisory uh, sorry the companies uh, or um, uh, the institutions under uh, the entities are registered uh, with uh, 40 different registrars uh, they are distributed between mainland and commercial free zones uh, we have financial free zones, but the financial free zones, uh, they are already uh, supervised everybody for their entities. But um, Ministry of Economy looking for uh, mainland and commercial free zones. Okay, this is the structure of uh, the national committees and in general, uh, the framework in UAE. Um, as you see here, it's the higher, we have a higher committee of supervising the national strategy of anti-money laundry. And this is headed by uh, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed al Nahyan, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International um, Cooperation. And uh, then we have Executive Office of Anti-Money Laundering and Compounding Finance and Terrorism which are, uh, this is also a new uh, announced last month. 
and it, it will be looking for uh, the mutual report of UAE and representing UAE in, uh, in uh, order of uh, anti-money laundering CFT. Uh, then we have the Financial Intelligence Unit, which is independent uh, unit, and um, Financial Intelligence Unit is um, the main uh, entity which receives all uh, suspicious transaction uh, reports, and they do their own in investigations if there is any uh, thing uh, the suspicious or, or they make sure that it is a crime so then they transfer it to enforcement um, entity um, okay and then we have the national anti-money laundering and company finance and terrorism and illegal organization committee uh, this is the main committee and they have their own uh, secret secretary then you can find the six sub committees uh, under the national uh, uh, committees. We have supervisory authorities of committees, which have seven uh, supervisory bodies. Uh, we have subcommittees uh, for technical compliance uh, of the United uh, Emirates. Uh, they are uh, responsible to review all legislation under AML and CFT. Uh, there is national risk assessment of money laundering uh, and financial terrorism and this also do the studies sectarian studies and they are also issuing the national risk assessment for uae there is subcommittee of company registrars in united Arab emirates which combine all the registrars in uae which are around 40 uh, registrars um, we have eight in mainland and 32 as free zone across UAE. We have also compassion terrorism financing and financing illegal organization and uh, proliferation financing subcommittees. They are looking for uh, the sanctions uh, list and also uh, financial uh, sanctions list for UN um, and also ter terrorism uh, financing list. Uh, finally, we have money laundering investigation authorities subcommittees, which are uh, included uh, the enforcement authority, which are uh, doing the investigations, and FIU or financial intelligence unit are also member in this subcommittee. So this is the uh, in general uh, the structure in UAE and how it works. And all of these uh, bodies are working together and coordination uh, happening between uh, these uh, members uh, and also for higher committees. Um, I'm gonna talk about the new department structure in uh, Ministry of Fi uh, the Ministry of Economy. Uh, we have uh, three main sections um, and uh, the director, as you see, we have uh, policies and risk department uh, section. We have head uh, or ML supervision. We have also enforcement section. This is the role of each uh, section in the department. As you see, we have a big mandate, uh, mainly in uh, risk and uh, policies and risk, uh, risk uh, section, which is assist uh, the risk of anti-money laundering and also establishing the policies and procedures. They are uh, carrying out training and workshops, guidance uh, issuance, uh, create also the database of uh, the NFTPs. Uh, we are doing also preparing and uh, doing research, um, uh, comparing and studying the best practices, uh, the best practices around the world. So this is the main um, role of uh, policies and risk sections. We have also uh, AML supervision sections, which will uh, prepare and approve the annual inspection plan. According uh, to this plan, uh, the Ministry of Economy will conduct inspections to uh, on-site and also office um, uh, inspections uh, for the NFTPs. Uh, we will do auditing and monitoring of site uh, inspections. As I said, 
we will also uh, make sure that the, the database is correct. We will coordinate uh, with a financial intelligence uh, unit if there is any suspicions or any matter or if there is any uh, coordination uh, or um, exchange of information. Uh, for enforcement section, um, as from his, uh, the, the name of the section, we will do uh, enforcement action against uh, the, um, uh, you know, against any uh, mistakes or uh, wrong practices uh, with the NFTs and any violations um, are uh, measured. So uh, the section of enforcement will issue the fines and uh, will make sure that the companies are uh, following up the procedures. So um, uh, in general, um, the NFTs are already uh, indicated or uh, mentioned in the legislation. Uh, under uh, Ministry of Economy for uh, main activities, which are pro brokers and real estate agents. We have dealers of precious metals and uh, precious stones. We have auditors and corporate service providers. In corporate service providers, it's um, actually, uh, we have so many questions about the term of corporate service providers, but here it's, uh, it's um, uh, the meaning is only for companies who involved in establishing other firms and other companies. So this is mainly uh, the activity of corporate service providers. And uh, for Ministry of Economies are implementing also a passive or financial uh, action task uh, recommendations. And we are also major uh, the uh, immediate outcomes and uh, also make sure that uh, all procedures mentioned in the law are followed up by these DNFTPs. And now we established uh, the campaign to register, uh, register all uh, DNFTPs in GoAML. Uh, the GoAML is a system uh, owned by FIU or Financial Intelligence Unit, where companies uh, can um, raise STRs or uh, suspicious transactions report, which is one of the procedures mentioned in the implementing um, decision uh, of uh, 2019. And uh, also there is other procedures uh, should be followed by uh, the DNFTPs. And uh, Ministry of Economy issue uh, guidelines. Uh, it's also published in the website of um, uh, website of the ministry. And uh, these guidelines have topics. Uh, also, it's uh, the topics come uh, from the federal law and also the cabinet decision. Uh, the main um, uh, topics is education and assessment of uh, anti-money laundry and finances tourism, uh, tourism uh, risk. And what is the standard, how to do the risk assessment because each company should do their own risk assessment of their business and for their clients. Also, they have to put uh, internally uh, policies to mitigate this uh, risk. They have to do uh, due diligence for their clients. And there is two kinds of uh, due diligence. We have the normal one uh, or uh, the simplified one and enhanced one. And the guidance also cover uh, the both uh, types. There is also a chapter about suspicious, uh, suspicious transaction report, which is SPR, the reports which should be uh, raised uh, through FIU and also to to, to um, raise these STRs, you have to register in GoML. To register in GoML, uh, company should appoint, uh, uh, you, you know what they call it, MLRO uh, officer. So uh, compliance officer should be appointed by uh, also the company. 
There is also governance in general, record keeping, international finance sections uh, chapter, and all of these will be included in the inspections of Ministry of Economy. Um, you can find the guidance in uh, the Ministry of Economy website. Uh, if you allow me, I will take you directly there. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, taking you to the... No, it's oh. not taking us. Can you stop sharing the screen and yes. reshare the screen again? Okay, sure. Okay, just tell me if you can yes, see we, the we website. The, okay. Yes, we can see. This is the website of the Ministry of Economy. This is the main uh, page. You can see that there is a countdown of registration on GoAML system. We have remaining uh, two, uh, eight days. And after this grace period, there will be penalties issued to non-registered uh, companies. Actually, you can click here to go to AML uh, page or you can uh, go through uh, this moving um, also uh, sliding uh, this is the page also so you have two ways to go but this is mainly um, the access to to, to the, the web page of AMM. Uh, this is an overview so the company uh, will do a very quick self-assessment by answering uh, some questions. This will help the company to know whether they are um, the NFTs or no. For example, if I answer all the question by yes, so this will be uh, changed. You are likely to be the NFTs and you are eligible to register for GoML. When they move to the next, uh, page. So what is the important notes? And uh, it's uh, they telling uh, the, the NFTs that there is two stages for registration. The company will consider registered if they finish the second stage. The first one is like security gate. And it, it, it needs uh, some uh, documents to be uploaded. And then approval from Ministry of Economy. If they successfully uh, finalize this and if it's approved, then they can go to the next, um, the next phase or next stage. So this is in general. Um, also here, they can find the guides. Uh, what is the pre-registration guide and registration guide? And there is also videos. This is printed one and this is uh, videos. And then you can move. This is the guidance. It's picture, uh, picturalized, and you can also um, see the, all the steps. What is the first step, second step, and also with uh, screenshots. OK, uh, this is uh, one. If you want to go to the videos, also there is important, uh, what is the de definitions of AML? What is the red flags? Some case studies um, and uh, financial about financial intelligence. It's very short uh, videos and how to register, how to submit uh, STR. So uh, this is the main uh, page for registration. There is also more in um, uh, anti money laundry. If you go through. Uh, the main page, you can find uh, the law and the guides and also uh, the decision. So this is in general. And uh, I hope that I give you a quick introduction. Um, and I'm here for any question. I think there is uh, so many questions uh, will be raised. Uh, Sofiq, I think we'll take the question later on. Uh, let the speaker uh, talk about okay. it. 
Yeah, yeah. that would be better. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Safiya Hashim, uh, for spending your valuable time with us today and sharing your insights and thoughts with the CA community. It was a privilege to have you among us today. Anti-money laundering is assuming utmost importance by each passing day and being conversant with AML compliance regulations and industry program measures is being inevitable. Thanks for highlighting the initiatives taken by the UA government in adopting best practices in developing an AML compliance program. Moving on to the first technical session of the day, we have with us Mr. Narasim Hadas, Associate Partner at Crow, to take us in detail through the various initiatives taken by the UAE in regards to anti-money laundering. Narasim Hadas is a member of the International Compliance Association, a trained lawyer as well as an in-house legal counsel, specializing in AML, CTF, compliance, corporate governance, risk management, and business advisory. Before moving to Crow, he was the director and legal head of a NYSE-listed global pharmaceutical company. He has authored a book titled Effective Compliance aimed at adding business value to organizations by building compliance culture, operational decision making and strategic planning post financial crisis scenario. Dear members, please join me in wel welcoming C. Narasimha Das to the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Anu Thomas. I'll straight away take through the presentation. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Can I hope? Yes. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. I'll try to keep the presentation simple and touching upon very core aspects which are relevant particularly to the accounts and auditing profession. Now this slide reflects all. It's a tightrope walking currently, so far as anti-money learning is concerned. So this slide reflects the current situation. Now, being a lawyer by qualification, I start with a disclaimer. This presentation, while I tried my best to present as accurately as possible, there's no liability attached to it. And then I cannot be made liable for any consequential losses. So don't take this as a professional advice. Now, when you're talking about the recent development of the UAE, there are developments in two fronts. One, an enhancement and elaborate clarifications and active uh, participation of the government in providing the necessary support in terms of the understanding the regulatory structure and also providing clarifications. This is one part of it. The other part of it is the, the, the national institutional framework has been substantially I mean, enhanced. Now, as I could see, as you, you have seen from the late presentation, Safia, you could see a, an elaborate government, government structure starting with the higher committee and then downwards and providing elaborate amount of coordination among the various institutions which regulate the, uh, um, or which, which are other are in, involved in the administration of this particular anti-money laundering. The other significant development is relating to designated non-financial business and professions. One of these professions is auditants and accountants. That's what we're talking about today. Then Ministry of Economy has issued recently two circulars, particular circle three and five of 2021 are relevant to the accountants auditors. Then you, you have a deadline for registering Go AML system. So I'll be talking very briefly about that. And very recently, in fact, the Ministry of Economy has announced a set of administrative fines for contraventions of various AML provisions. So I'll be talking briefly about that. And then just two case studies, just to, as an example to see uh, some of the recent developments. In UAE currently, majorly these are the regulatory authorities. So far as auditors and accountants are concerned, the Ministry of Economy is the regulatory authority. Now, 
Now, this is the RNA structure. It is the diagram I have taken from the Ministry of Economy website. In fact, Ministry of Economy website, I would say, it has a lot of information and very helpful information, videos, and a, 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 it's, it's worth spending some time on this particular website. It's an enormous learning uh, to learn about the entire AML and then how our government approach and then everything. So you will see here, in fact, the same uh, structure uh, as shown by earlier speaker. Now, this is how uh, an elaborate structure has been available. The reason as to why such a structure is required, enforcement of any law requires a supervision and continuous monitoring by the government. And also it requires an enormous amount of coordination, particularly when uh, offenses like anti-money la money laundering terrorism financing and sanctions compliance, when they are to be monitored and regulated and controlled, you require a, an elaborate structure. And then currently the government has put in place an elaborate structure at different levels, starting from national strategy, aligning with the international requirements and also bringing in alignment among various regulatory authorities. It is very important that when you have an effective institutional structure now, it, it adds a lot of strength to enforcement uh, and compliance. Now, as I said, these are the categories of uh, professions which are classified as auditors and accountants, company service providers. The basic reason as to why these have been identified as designated professions are they are the front line. They are at the front line at the entry point where illegal money can enter into the legal financial system. And particularly out of all these five categories, auditors and accountants, probably they will have the highest visibility in, because they look into the financial affairs, they advise on the financial affairs, they also advise on the tax structuring and several other things which they do. So in terms of auditors and accountants, now they, are, they, they need to play a very major role in terms of fine, uh, fighting the financial crime. Now, this responsibility is reflected in the elaborate arrangements that have been made by the government in terms of supervising these DNFPs and also bringing in a very regulated and then very disciplined structure that will help in strengthening the economy by fighting the illegal money. Now, when you look at the, what are the summary of the statutory obligations which DNVPs have, identify crime risk. Now, this crime risk, what you're talking about is the crime of money laundering, that is converting dirty money into legal money, then combating or financing terrorism, financing illegal organizations, or violation of sanctions international sanctions or even national sanctions. Now, these are collectively covered by the legislation, federal AMA legislation, and then they are elaborately covered as of now. And they need to take necessary due diligence measures. We'll, we'll explain further what they are. And then they should refrain from conducting certain transactions which are anonymous, which is a pseudonym, because there is a threat of um, anonymity or other things which are, which will help uh, perpetration of the crime. And they should develop internal policies and they should promptly apply what are the applicable sanctions directives that are applicable. And most importantly, they need to directly report suspicious transactions to the financial intelligence unit. This is one of the important statutory obligations of the NAPPs. Now the circular five, which has been recently issued, actually there are a series of circulars that have been issued by the Ministry of Economy. Circulars one to four deal with each one of the designated uh, uh, DNA BPs, which are under the regulatory purview of the Ministry of Economy. Circular five serves as a reminder, and also it also clearly mentions that the last date for uh, GoAML registration is 31st March 2021. And then, and then clearly reminds that failure to report STRSR as a criminal offense, thereby it's punishable. 
and failure to complete the GoML registration itself is punishable. And then they also remind that the, fine, the, the authorities have the discretion to impose fine anywhere between 50,000 to uh, 5 million their hands as fine in case of a breach. Now the circular three. Circular three, I would say, is the most important circular so far as auditors and accountants are concerned. The circular five actually summarizes beautifully the obligations, the most important obligations of accountants and auditors. It's worth reading circular and it clearly says that you must do the following. It's very clear directive. Now, in terms of legal and regulatory importance, when there's a law, there's a regulatory authority, Ministry of Economy, and that regulatory uh, regulator authority clearly issues circular to all auditors. You must do the following. So it's a clear directive that has been issued to auditors and accountants who fall within their regulatory purview to do these things. One appointment of compliance officer. The second thing is due diligence measures. The third is reporting STRSAR. The fourth is registration go ML system. The fifth is registration and automatic reporting system for sanctions list to the extent that apply. In fact, it would actually um, provide only for registered email ID through which you will receive updated United Nations and UAE sanctions list that will help in terms of monitoring whether in respect of your clients, uh, whether they're affected by sanctions or anything. And it also summarizes inspection procedures, how, how the ministry uh, proposes to construct, uh, conduct inspections uh, in enforcing these obligations. Now, viewed from that perspective, the customer due diligence measures, what they're talking very broadly, there are two things, two elements. Who the person is, the legal person or national person, whoever is your client. Identify him with reference to appropriate documents. What does the customer do? And who controls the customer? That means who is the ultimate beneficial owner or person who actually directs the, the individual or, the, or this particular entity in terms of conducting business or whatever it is, transactions. The other element is economic activity. That is the financial part of it. Where is the money coming from? Where is the money going? and monitoring that. Now, sometimes a question may arise, okay, if my job is to only audit the financial st statements of previous year, where is any question of financial uh, transactions monitoring? Now, that's not what they meant. The monitoring is in relation to the actual service you provide to that extent, exercising the relevant uh, caution and uh, for example i'll give one particular example for example it so happens that there's a big business which was very much there in the previous year but for some reason it has collapsed Im immediately after the closure of the financial year while it may be a subsequent event necessarily alter needs to take into consideration that subsequent event also in terms of reporting and whatever observations he makes. Now, assume for a moment, this particular event, which has collapsed the business, happens to be uh, connected with some illegal finance or illegal issues. Then, so far as anti-money land law is concerned, you need to necessarily look from that perspective also. So the word monitoring needs to be interpreted based on the service you provide. There's one more element to the customer due diligence because the base, the one of the purpose of customer due diligence, I'll explain later. But the custom, when you make customer due diligence, these are being identified as higher risk factors, which need to nominate director cash intensive businesses, excessively complex structures like you know, offshore structures and then unnecessary use of offshore structures, 
every time whenever there is an offshore structure, I hear two explanations. One they say tax planning, and then they say succession planning. Sometimes I find that 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 particular explanation is not correct. Now countries identified as having inadequate AML systems, countries subject to sanctions, countries known to support terrorism and the presence of politically exposed persons within those structures, within the client structures, and anonymous transactions. These have been regularly identified as major higher risk factors. That means when you're making customer due diligence initially itself, you'll make a profile of the customer. When you're making the profile of the customer, you, you will identify, um, I mean, when you make a due diligence, whether these risk factors are present or not, if they are present, necessarily you have to assign a higher risk rating. This is very important. Then these are the general indicators. Transactions involving locations with you know, where, where there, is, there is poor controls and then corruption. Significant and frequent transactions in known or expected business activity. This known and expected business activity is actually is in reference to initial profiling you have made. At the time of due diligence, you made a profile, but what you're finding today is something different from, or something which, which you know as expected business activity. The other important thing is ambiguous and inconsistent explanations as to source or purpose of funds or Sometimes, you know, the nervousness or corporate behavior that has been exhibited. The reason as to why this becomes important, these three slides, why they are important in this connection. A thorough understanding of these slides will help you in detecting the suspicious transactions. What is suspicious transaction? A suspicious transaction is a suspicion on a reasonable ground that a crime that is any one of the four money laundering or terrorism financing or illegal financing illegal organizations or sanctions non compliance has been committed or attempted to be committed. Now to, as to have that reasonable ground, one of the important factors is presence of either high risk factors or general indicators or a combination of both. Once they are there, and you're seeing very frequent transactions in a, in a particular account, that itself is a reasonable ground for you to report. So when, when this is there, this section becomes very important. Now let us deal with this particular section very carefully. These are the recent administrative fines published by the Ministry of Economy. There are four broad categories of fines, three contraventions coming under the category of 1 million, five contraventions coming in the category of 200,000 dirhams, seven contraventions coming under 100,000 dirhams, and 11 contraventions 50,000 dirhams. When substantial fines, these actually, honestly, these are deterrent fines. They're imposing, they, they, they propose to impose the deterrent appropriate fines in appropriate cases, because that is also required as part of the enforcement measures. Now, 1 million category, one of the important things for you to take measures in respect of international and domestic sanctions list. Where will you get the sanctions list? When you actually register in that particular um, system, sanction system, as advised under circular five and circular three, you will let regularly get emails uh, updated uh, sanctions list of UAE as well as UN. And necessarily, you need to keep a, a process by which these are identified, or with reference that your clients are identified, their benefits are identified, are continuously monitored. In the event uh, a, a particular hit is there, then you are supposed to take certain measures like reporting. Then, 200 category, if, if for some reason due diligence is not possible, 
it may be a, a refusal to give some document it may be that some due diligence has not been satisfactorily carried out because of some reason of the client or whatever it is then you have a duty to report that as a suspicious transaction under the goml system and if if you fail to do that then 200000 dirhams is the administrative fine similarly where there are indications of higher risk the law now obligates conducting a enhanced due diligence if you fail to conduct then 200000 and what is more important is tipping off in the event if you 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 file a suspicious transaction report or or you you are actually entertaining suspicion you must ensure that your client or his representatives are not um, made aware directly or indirectly and if such, such a thing is done 200000 dirhams no very frequently we find auditors issuing isa 260 reports or management letters sometimes disclosing certain things or discussing certain things which are not actually part of the main audit report it is quite possible that while doing so some material which is directly or indirectly uh, and could amount potential amount of tipping off may also find a place there so we should be very careful now now uh, on account of this when drafting the isa 260 or whatever management letter letters then failure to identify crime risk failure to perform dd before establishing failure to perform pep related due diligence delay in sdr str through go aml now there is a tricky situation so far as companies which are regular, um, governed by commercial compliance law is concerned i think it's article 249 which says that whenever you detect a breach of law you are required to report within 10 days it's not as though you 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 find a place the, that breach will find a place in the audit report now there's another angle to it a delay in uh, filing str through go aml can result in a fine then if you don't have policies procedures or if there's the proper training then 50000 i just gave you a few extract but you know you find the all the things elaborately in the announcements now go aml registration you have a very clear uh, ministry of economy website it has videos and so many it's a very easy process so go aml registration before 31st march is mandatory now let us see couple of cases the one audit and accounting firm is conducting due diligence for a, um, on a potential investor because the dubai based company wanted a strategic investor so it has engaged this abc company and then they are conducting due diligence now the audit firm obviously last uh, about source of funds and the potential investor produced a bank comfort letter we further confirm with full bank responsibility that the funds are good clean and cleared funds and by lawful business practices what do you think of this kind of a letter it looks to me it's very unusual on the part of the bank to certify like this the the reason as to why i stated this case is this is enough this is enough for you to file an str or sar you need not go further you are not a police agency you are not a, a, a criminal investigation agency you need not go what is required is a reasonable ground for suspicion this particular thing could potentially indicate that this strategic investor is actually making an attempt to probably i mean we don't know this tactic is probability that he may be doing it maybe 70% is innocent but this is this forms according to me reasonable ground for launching an str let us see another case say an audit firm is conducting has conducted audit for the financial year 2020 
as part of audit, obviously, the auditors collect bank statements. The bank statements show certain cash transactions through ATMs, transfer such amounts to another country. It's quite frequent. They see that. In fact, the bank's compliance department had reported these transactions as suspicious through GoAML. The, the difficulty with STRs are their contradiction. The bank will never disclose that they have actually lodged an STR. And on many occasions, the bank may continue to allow that account to go on because there's no corresponding obligation that whenever the STR is placed, the bank is bound to close that account. So bank has taken decision with their continuing account. So the year in full financial bank statement has come. Neither the auditor nor the client is aware the STR has been filed by the bank. And audit firm has issued normal audit report. Now what will happen to audit firm tomorrow there's an investigation. Now this is a new challenge coming on account of this GoML system. What I found in GoML system and FIU is a very, is a very efficient system. In fact, once you have the access, you will also get access to a lot of information like analysis of previous STR reports or the further guidance and instructions. And it's a continuously very dynamic kind of uh, system has been developed. Um, I mean, it's very useful. So this, be, this makes it very obligatory on the part of the bank because it, as I understand from the data that, that's available, more than 15,000 STRs have been filed uh, in the year 2020 by the bank, particularly banks and other financial institutions. So this year when, the, when you are doing the audit, there's a high probability that at least some of the auditors will encounter bank statements in respect of which already STRs have been filed in the GoML system. So this is another emerging uh, situation. So one has to be very careful when conducting the audit. Uh, bank statements, on many occasions it so happens that the, these verifications are left to a junior level auditors, but that can be dangerous. So thank you. I'm available for questions. I try to complete as fast as possible. Thank you, uh, Narsim Rauji, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks, Ms. Safaya, uh, for your <laughs> uh, kind presentation also, and very nicely explaining about uh, uh, you know, the series of circular issued by Ministry of uh, Economy and also Narsim Ravji highlighting about the circular number three, which is very important as far as uh, the accountant and auditors are concerned about appointment of compliance officer, due diligence measures, STR, registration in the GoAML, and also, uh, you know, highlighting the penalties by Ministry of Economy and also the new challenges which has emerged due to this uh, uh, you know, new circular. So uh, we have received many uh, questions and that this itself shows that how interesting and important is this topic. And uh, uh, so we will we'll try to take some few quick questions and, uh, you know, one or two questions I would also post to uh, Miss Safaya uh, and we will see if we can, we can, uh, you know, do this. So the first question which has come from Mr. Abdullah Radhi is that pertaining to registration of Go AML, any company received a notification from ministry must register or depending on if you conduct one of the activities in Article 3. And is it required for a company that manage its own property to register in Go AML? So this is the first question by uh, our member, Mr. Abdullah Radhi. And I could request uh, Safiya ji to uh, answer this. Yes. Okay, thank you for raising uh, this uh, up. Uh, some um, uh, there is uh, some uh, misunderstanding uh, about who should register. Uh, actually, only the activities mentioned in the legislation uh, should register in GoML, even if they receive it, uh, because uh, now the circulars uh, are posted uh, from Ministry of Economy registrars. Uh, some uh, consultants uh, company also post uh, the circulars to all companies, but uh, 
only only the activities mentioned uh, in the um, uh, cabinet decision are required to to register for um, what is this next questions regarding um, uh, so the question is that uh, the company that manages its own property uh, yes. so will it fall under the definition of real yes. estate for real estate it's not all activities of uh, real estate it's only for uh, real estate agents who sell and buy properties sure only uh, for managing uh, properties uh, managing uh, for example rents are not included okay perfect so i think this also answers the second question which was uh, raised by mr mustafa devasali who said that if company is managing a property and leasing flats and mm -hmm. shops that are they required to register and we called for a call center and meaning he is raising his query saying that we have informed that we do not have could you please confirm appreciate so i i hope you have already confirmed this uh, safiya ji thank you so i will ask you one more small question before i i go to the another question and take it with uh, mr narasimha rao uh, is there any training provided uh, from ministry of economy you know because uh, there is also a penalty uh, which which comes if you know training is not provided to the staff so is there any uh, plan training uh, or uh, where people can go and have uh, take training now we have uh, the, the videos uh, only for goyml on how uh, to register and how to raise up uh, or uh, report the goyml also we are going to conducting uh, some uh, workshops um and this also uh, will be uploaded in the youtube channel of the department of, of, of aml and uh, it's ongoing outreach uh, we have a full uh, plan during the year and yes we will conduct more trainings okay perfect thank you yes thank you so okay i will uh, uh, also ask this question maybe uh, to you on the safiya ji because this is relevant for you so our uh, past chairman suresh panwar he is asking normally how much time it takes to uh, get the user approved yes uh, within 24 hours um, actually we are trying our best to approve it within the same day but also during working hours if the application came after the working hours so it will be approved next day but no more than 24 hours perfect that's great that's very nice thank you uh, so narsimha rao ji uh, there is a question by mr r k mehta ji uh, he is asking uh, what is okay, just is... one i miss one second sure, uh, sure. you are addressing uh, mr narsimha das uh, narsimha rao he is mr ah, das sorry. so <laughs> sorry 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 <laughs> uh, it's my mind uh, so uh, narsimha das ji i'm sorry so uh, the question is from sir rakesh mehta what is significant value of a transaction significant what it mean uh, by yeah. uh, the yeah. value the, the transaction while we are uh, monitoring the transaction is there a value assigned to a transaction where we have to uh, monitor the transaction and for the purpose of raising as suspicious um, transaction report yeah there is no threshold for a specific amount it's depend on the suspicious uh, and the questions asked by the officer because of that uh, in the legislation they mention uh, who can be or what is the the role of the uh, uh, amlro and uh, he should knows exactly uh, who is dealing with and ask some questions about the source of fund uh, kind of transaction um, type of client depends on who these questions he is asking or uh, they know their customer they conduct their kyc then they can raise the suspicious report and uh, also uh, there is video in um, our website mention the red flags so when he indicate this red flags then he can raise the scr it's not only about the amount yeah perfect yeah so as as the general indicator also uh are yeah, displayed on the website of the ministry of economy and as also explained by mr narsimha das ji uh, thank you so there is another question from uh, pradeep kumar who is asking while making pre registration system is asking the details of user registering and whether the user should be the person whose name is mentioned in the trade license or it can be any person which is nominated by the company 
which yeah. may not be there in the trade license uh, it doesn't matter if he is a partner or no actually the company can appoint uh, any staff in uh, the company or they can appoint also uh, outsource company to be their admiral but they should be responsible for the information they deliver uh, through the strs or the procedures uh, within the company because uh, when we conduct the inspections and the procedures were implementing wrongly the officer will be responsible so they can either uh, nominate anyone in the company but the uh, or outsource but he should uh, be uh, you know updated and know exactly uh, what is the procedures uh, need to be implemented in the company yeah very clear so uh, no matter who is who's, uh, whose name is given but the yes. company is responsible for the action yes uh, but uh, when you. registering uh, uh, through the goemen we ask for the authorization letter to be uh, uploaded uh, along with the id of this officer and it this authorization not, letter should be signed by the ceo right by the signatories uh, or the partner or the manager of the company depending so, upon and the, and the trade license also and the ids of this uh, officer yes okay perfect thank you so there is one question for uh, banks uh, the questionnaire name is not there but it's saying that all these penalties which are outlined by ministry of economy are applicable on banks also or the no. penalties are governed by central bank of uae for the banks yes no 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 this uh, because uh, this list is still not um, uh, officially translated but it's mentioned in the title it's only penalties for the nfps under the provision of uh, ministry of justice and ministry of economy so it's only for the nfps not financial uh, entities thank you thank you for clarifying uh, so one more question is again from mr abdullah radhi is that is it must for the compliance officer or mlro to be based in uae or is it possible to be one from the group outside uae i believe uh, it can be even outsourced also right yes, it can be it can be unless yes. we deliver the correct information actually sure. residency is not uh, compulsory but uh yeah and also for goemel for otp if he is registering uh, the system is accepting international uh, numbers also sure sure yes. uh i have one one another uh, small question like for example as uh, mr narsimha das ji said that those who would register in goemel uh, mm -hmm. they will get access to the international and domestic sanction list uh, and suppose if there is company who also want to uh, Uh, know about this list you know to have the best practice is it possible uh, those who have not registered on the goml system they can get access to this international and domestic sanction list okay um they are separately different systems okay, okay. goml is under fiu and the sanction list uh, automated system is under uh, another entity it's uh, the the office of um we call it uh, material and um i'm not sure about the name and um, uh, it's for external and um i'm not sure about the name now but it's different different system and uh, it is um easy easy to register you just put your name and email and that's it you will be subscribed it's similar to you know if you have a newsletter so any update in the sanction list you have the access to that and the link is already mentioned in the circular so anyone can be um, registered it's free of charge and you will be updated with the sanction list immediately and the uh, required is not only to be updated it's required to be aware of not um, dealing with these uh, names either if they are individuals or organization so you have to stop dealing with them and if you have any uh, money available uh, you have to freeze it immediately and inform uh, the supervisory body which is ministry of economy thank you thank you safaya ji so thank obviously you. although we have uh, some lot more question but uh, due to the paucity of time we would like to stop here and right. would like to express our thanks to you as well as uh, mr narsimha das ji for taking the session on anti money laundering and giving the updates thank, thank you, you.
Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Fair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Narsimha Ji. Hi, good evening to all of you. My name is Anand Gupta. I would like to introduce the speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Surinder Jasrani. He is the CEO and managing partner at MMJS Consulting Group, a CA by qualification and entrepreneur by nature. Prior to founding MMJS, he was he held key key position at HSBC Private Equity, Infosys, LNT, and GM. He was selected as the corporate icon of the UAE for the third consecutive year by the leading magazine in the region. Our second speaker is Mr. Anas. He is a director at MMJS and leads the tax practice in KSE, KSA. He is specialized in direct and indirect tax and has over nine years of experience in international and local tax matters in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Anas has supported thousands of clients with their complex tax matter and has built a reputation with a GAJT. He has completed his GCC VAT diploma from the Association of Taxation Technicians and recently qualified as ADIT from CIOT in the UK. Our third speaker is Mr. Rishabh Tandon. He is a senior manager at MMJS and is the technical lead on VAT for the Bahrain office. He is CA and has over seven years of indirect tax experience, tax experience, assisting clients in VAT implementation, diagnostic reviews, and compliance in various sectors, including real estate, financial services, hospitality, consumer market, to name a few. Our fourth and last speaker is Jay D'Souza, is a senior manager at MMJS and is responsible for VAT and excise tax specializing in helping retail, real estate, and automotive sectors. Jay has eight years of indirect tax experience, leading various tax implementation advisory assignments for Mercu clients in UAE. Jay has also played a critical role during the implementation of GS GST in India, advising clients on various tax changes. He is a CA and has done GCC VAT diploma from ATT UK. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Anand, for a wonderful and long uh, speaker introduction. Uh, I'm sure it's always long. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Abu Dhabi chapter uh, leadership team. Mr. Neeraj, thank you very much for always uh, giving an opportunity. And also is the first presentation uh, for the new committee, I would say. So congratulations and all the best for the future. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Safiya and uh, uh, Mr. Narsimha Das. I think I attended the first AML session and very informative. And I can see uh, how Ms. Safiya, you explained the structure. And I went back to the VAT days when we were explaining this, how VAT committees and the FTA committee were set up uh, in UAE for taxes. So uh, I remember my old days of three and a half years when we were doing this. And very useful information. Thank you very much for that. Uh, today, we are here to talk about uh, GCC tax. Uh, I mean, as I keep saying, as a MMJs, we wanted one GCC, one firm. Uh, what do I mean by that? To have one leadership team, one senior management, one management, one execution. And why so? Because as of all the six countries, they all are very integrated. You know, there's a forward learning, there's a backward learning. We wanted a one firm to take care of the taxes to support the businesses who has a presence in all the countries. So with that, you know, uh, it is very important that we are in UAE. We am in UAE if you are in other countries, uh, but we are not going to talk about UAE VAT today. Maybe it looks like a strange, but uh, we uh, we have done a lot of events on UAE VAT. It is very important to see what is happening in other countries. Uh, like Saudi and UAE implemented VAT at the same time. But Saudi has uh, gone ahead with more changes than the UAE, for example, like the rate change from 5%, it has went to 15%. How was that journey? I mean, uh, then uh, see, Atulji has mentioned very, very learn point. When VAT becomes old, what becomes new is the audit in the VAT and then the litigation. Now, litigation has begun in UAE. We have seen the first Supreme Court case in UAE. However, we would like to see, you know, what is happening in other countries. Like 
Saudi Arabia has a tax system for many years. So Anas, my colleague uh, based out of uh, Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, will share more about how Saudi is tackling with the current reforms and the VAT changes, and also what is the litigation. Now, why it is important for businesses in UAE to hear what is happening in other countries? Like I said, having a forward and backward learning. You will definitely be uh, learning a lot of things as it's happening in other countries, which definitely will be important at one point in time in the future. So we always want to focus how we guide our businesses for the future. Uh, then we thought, let's see what is happening in Bahrain. Like after Saudi and UAE, Bahrain implemented the VAT. Uh, there are many things which are happening in Bahrain, uh, which are not in the UAE. For example, Bahrain has come up with the tax evasion crime unit, which is very interesting if you ask me. And I think my colleague Rishabh, uh, who leads Bahrain practice, will be speaking on that. Uh, then it's very interesting to see uh, Oman, the fourth country, which is coming up with a VAT in just 18 to 20 days. And Jay, who is based in Oman, right, while we speak, and he leads Oman there. Uh, he will share a few things which uh, might be helpful to the businesses in UAE. And the businesses in UAE might want to see what is happening in other countries. Maybe they want to plan to enter those markets. So it's always good to have that learning for our neighboring places or the states. And today's session is all about uh, VAT plus some more taxes, especially in Saudi Arabia. So I'm sure uh, uh, always I keep saying, you know, you definitely will learn something new and it will be helpful to you as you go. This is our endeavor to spread knowledge and be with you always. So with this, I'll hand over to Anas. Uh, uh, Anas, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Surandar. Okay, great. So um, as, as Surrender correctly mentioned, um, it's, it's very important to know about the other countries, how they're implementing the taxes. And as you all might be aware, that case is specifically like has expanded more on the tax um, aspects, especially with the 2030 vision um, and giving like more attention to the other uh, type of revenues other than the oil uh, that they have in, in the country. So therefore, like, KSA has went um, over and beyond and they're implementing like different types of taxes. And um, like just going to the next slide, we will see the, the types of the taxes that KSA has implemented. Uh, this These kind of taxes has been implemented like I would say from 1950. Um, and that's maybe a surprise for, for people to hear about that taxes has been there in KSA from 1950. And then it was updated like in 2004. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, can, can we move to the next slide, please, the presenter? Yeah, please, the next one. OK, so um, now we're going to start with an overview about the taxes in KSA. So in the next slide, um, if you can move to the next slide, Rishab, please. I think we're having, sorry, we're having this inconvenience. Uh, there is a disconnect. Sorry. Maybe someone is liking this picture most. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, Anna, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. If you can shift to the next slide, please, because it's stuck on the first slide. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start sharing from my side, um, if you allow me. I think it's stuck from your side. Okay, so is, is my screen clear to everyone, please? If you can confirm that. Yeah, we can see, uh, Mr. Anas, but have you taken an external out so that we are not, we cannot see it maximized? Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Um, I think it got stuck a bit.
Anas, yeah. is it fine now? Yeah, it's good. It's good now. Thank you. I think my screen is stuck <laughs> again. No worries, An Anas. Uh, I I'll move the slides. You can continue. Okay, sure. Now, um, the problem is my screen is stuck for a second. Or my computer, my whole... Can, can you hear me, guys? Because... Yeah, we, we can, can hear you, Anas. Yeah, we are good. Yeah, we can see. Okay, great. But I can't see the screen. I don't know what's exactly happening with my computer. You are restarting, Anas? Anas, are you restarting the laptop? Maybe I think, uh, Rishabh, you want to continue until the time Anas comes in? Hello. Yeah, Rishab, I think we can continue Bahrain uh, till the time Anas uh, comes back to, to save time for everybody. Sure. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, yes. Um, so coming on to Bahrain, we saw uh, um, the agenda for today. Just if we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, the agenda for uh, the Bahrain VAT law is basically to discuss the owning exempt exports and imports. What are the key learnings which we have derived from the National Bureau of Revenue, which is a tax authority there? What are the key learnings which we have derived from the BAT audits which have happened? So once I am there at the topic, I will just explain you that what is the difference that how the tax authority in Bahrain operates and how the tax authority in uh, UAE operates. The third one is a brief discussion on penalties and prosecution. And definitely, uh, I will tell you the reason that why are we discussing the penalty and prosecution and why, uh, you know, it is important to discuss that. So uh, if you all can see my slide, uh, Bahrain had implemented VAT on 1st of January 2019, exactly after one year, uh, after UAE and Saudi did. Scope of VAT remains the same uh, in terms of goods and services and uh, rate of VAT is 5%, which is the standard rate of VAT, zero rated uh, supply, and then there's an exempt. Uh, date of supply is similar to how we have in UAE, which is earliest of issuance of uh, tax invoice, partial receipt of uh, partial or full receipt of payment or delivery of goods, whichever is earlier. Uh, a key uh, change is the tax period is basically monthly, quarterly, and annual. Uh, monthly is for companies who have a annual taxable supply in the last 12 months uh, of more than 3 million dinars, which is 30 million dirham. Quarterly for businesses who have a business uh, of annual taxable supplies of less than 3 million. And there is an annual VAT return, which has to, which can be filed by very small businesses, which have a turnover of, or I would say annual taxable supplies in the last 12 months uh, of around 100,000 dinars. The tax filing deadline is last day of the month, which for here we have a small difference, uh, wherein in the UAE it is 28. And Another difference is there in the deadline to raise the tax invoice, which says that 15 days from the end of the month in which the supply took place. So for example, if there is a supply which has taken place on 1st of March, 2021, a business can raise the tax invoice till 15th of April, 2021. However, it does not mean that issuance of tax invoice will shift my date of supply. My date, my, uh, my reporting will still happen in the month of March uh, for that particular supply. 
moving on to the next slide uh yes uh, so in so in terms of zero rated domestic sales there are uh, few sectors which are zero rated um, in terms of the bahrain vat law it is similar to uae but uh, slight changes are there uh, so there is a list of 94 basic items which is zero rated which includes your dairy products pulses and uh, you know very basic basic food items which is not there in the uae education private health care is zero rated uh, similar to uae we have zero rating for the sectors in bahrain as well domestic oil and gas is also uh, you know zero rated which is petroleum and gasoline products domestic and international transportation is also zero rated now here we have a slight difference here because local transportation in uae is exempt wherein in bahrain it is zero rated uh there are two sectors wherein we find major difference uh one is the gold industry uh, which i would say jewelers wherein the only difference is that the precious stones are also subject to zero rate in bahrain whereas in the ue we don't see any zero rating for the precious stones otherwise gold silver platinum which are investment grade metals are subject to zero rate in both the countries the main difference in terms of zero rate is pertains to the real estate and the construction sector so i'll just touch up touch upon that what a, what does the provision say uh, specifically as per uae vat law then i'll just do a slight comparison for uh, you know from bahrain perspective so as per the uae vat law uh, construction services are subject to a standard rate and then the first supply of residential uh real estate is zero rated wherein commercial is uh, you know at a standard rate now what bahrain has done bahrain has actually zero rated the construction services of new building so any contractor who is constructing a new building in bahrain has to charge zero rate related to the developer or the owner another major difference is that the first supply or subsequent supplies of real estate whether it is residential whether it is commercial they all are exempt so it's a, it's a major hit for uh, the real estate industry i would say because uh, the input tax credits which pertain to which are incurred by the developers are not recoverable to them so that's a major change which is there uh, or i would say a major difference in terms of the real estate sector uh moving on to the next slide uh, we would be discussing the exempt supplies so as it is similar like supply of financial services like issue allotment of shares interest income life insurance and reinsurance products and services are all subject to exempt are all considered as an exempt activity uh and as i said that rental and sale of residential and commercial real estate uh, are subject to a exempt are subject to exempt sure. law, exemption yes yes yeah. yes yeah i think mr neeraj wants to add something yeah no arisha just said some can you adjust your camera we can't see your face boss uh, is it okay now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. little, little more really, slightly more i am uh, i am really sorry for that i did not uh, notice while i was speaking so apologies uh, yeah. from my side no no problem a little more if you can bring it forward the Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Is it okay now? Thank you now? so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Neeraj, for uh, noticing that. And thank you so much. Uh, so exempt supplies, as we said, uh, that supply of financial services is similar to UAE. The only major difference we see uh, is uh, in the real estate sector, wherein I mean the sale and lease of real residential and commercial real estate is. is considered as an exempt activity similarly like bear land is there bear land is an exempt uh, activity in bahrain um, as well and in, in it's the same in the ue uh, uh moving on to the next slide is uh, in terms of the export provisions which are there uh, Rishab, in reserve allow me to add one point see it is very yes, important yes. we are highlighting this difference like if you see a zero rate the food products in bahrain are zero rate that means water milk sugar these yes. all products the 93 basic products or 94 basic products were supposed to be zero rate or exempt even in uae if we all recall four years back 
yes you will yes. choose not to do that uh, to keep it simple so that there is no discussion about what is zero rate what is exim for example yes. fresh meat or frozen meat whether fresh is zero or frozen is zero there's a lot of litigation which comes in like for example in india still now there are some settlement whether kit kat is a chocolate or a biscuit there was a huge case yes. going on, on this so ue chose to standard rate to simplify it so that there is no ambiguity today while we are discussing we have few businesses they are in the fruits and vegetable business and they are asking in oman the discussion is going on in terms of final executive regulation whether whether mushrooms will be zero rated exempt or standard rate so you know it is very important to understand when you choose to apply the law to some sector or some products it doesn't just stop there it is a lifelong continuation of those provisions like in uk from 40 years the pringles the chips whether it is a potato or it is a chips because it is made up of potato but it has changed the shape so it has a different uh, treatment and there are cases going on so this brings a lot of uncertainty you know the way you decide the law the way you apply the law it gives us a lot of certainty or uncertainty to the positions and it is always a risk for the businesses because they don't know what will be taxable because they would have taken an interpretation it is taxable or zero rate or uh, exempt or zero rate but ultimately it might be different right so sometimes it is good to be simple another important thing which rishabh mentioned mentioned is exempt uh, in uae uh, the first i mean in bahrain it is exempt the residential and commercial these any expense you incur for that it becomes a cost so what happens you know the cost of operation goes up so there are there are very beautiful provisions in uae when we compare to others for a sustainability of the sector so i just want to bring the differences for a betterment and also i mean how it can be betterment for the industry and the economy and for the respective country so yeah uh, rishabh please go on i just wanted to highlight that yes uh, thank you thank you surinder for adding it and yes uh, it it makes a lot of difference when uh, in terms of you know why a particular product or a service is zero rated and why it is standard rated in some other country it uh, brings on to a lot of classification and litigation issues uh, uh, similarly when we were implementing vat in bahrain uh, all these food and uh, you know these customers or clients which were there in the food industry they were not very sure that what all these 94 basic items will include because there was a lot of issue in the hsn classification so whether whether this particular hsn as you gave an example of mushroom i remember one of my client asking me whether all the types of fishes would be uh, you know subject to zero rate or you know it would be subject to standard rate so yes uh, we have to see all these things well thank you so much uh moving on to the exports uh, slide uh, as you all can see uh, uh exports can be related to goods or it can be related to export of services uh there are few three condition the three main conditions which are uh, as per mentioned as per the bahrain mat law to qualify an export uh if we talk about goods it says that the goods goods must be shipped within 90 days from the date of supply the goods must not have changed its nature uh, or they would have not been used or sold to third party within bahrain the third important point is that supplier must retain all the commercial and official documents uh, evidencing that the export is made so this third point is very important and uh, recently we saw the national bureau of revenue which is a tax, tax authority in bahrain in one of the audits they conducted they nullified the exports uh which were made by a business because they were not able to sufficiently explain that they have made an export and the goods have moved by road from you know bahrain to saudi and it was subjected to a standard rate by uh, the tax authority a uh, coming on to export of services uh, there are few conditions which are there uh, that customers should not have any residence in bahrain when customer should not be present in bahrain when the services are actually performed the services should not be used or enjoyed in bahrain and it should not be related to any real estate or any tangible goods like any movable you know personal assets which are there or any tangible goods the services should not be uh, related to those if all these four conditions are satisfied uh, an export of service would be qualified 
coming on to the next slide uh, which talks about imports uh, so unlike ua uh, there is a major difference here though uh, bahrain vat law or i mean speaks about uh, bahrain vat law speaks about deferment of import duty uh, this option is still not uh, activated or enforced in bahrain so any business who is importing goods in the ue has to physically pay the import vat at the customs port and then vat can uh, when the goods can be uh, cleared in terms of import of services well yes uh, well while we are importing uh, services in bahrain a reverse charge mechanism is applicable uh, while the reporting in the vat return is little bit different in bahrain but yes the procedure and the accounting would remain the same uh moving on to the next slide so again uh, i would like to i would like to mention uh, categorically the ua is uh, better provision from a cash flow perspective on the flow. import of goods so when we import the goods in ua we do reverse charge mechanism that means we don't pay cash in terms of import vat that is a big relief uh, why because first of all your money gets stuck in the inventory if you have to pay 5% on top of that until you sell it you cannot adjust it so you don't pay in ue but in bahrain you need to pay vat it's a big difference when you are into the trading business or into the manufacturing business because your cash gets stuck and the whole cash flow can be chopped up here please uh, shall we can move absolutely um so moving on to the next topic which is approach of nbr uh, towards vat audit and why are we discussing that uh, just to highlight one thing uh, it is it is not a usual thing from a federal from the federal tax authority in the uae to audit businesses and uh, we would have seen around 4 to 5% of companies being audited once by the federal tax authority however in bahrain uh, to everyone's surprise i would like to mention at least 75% of the companies are being audited once by the end by the national bureau of revenue in the last two years and three months uh how the process happens in in bahrain is that once you file your vat return within 15 days within 30 days maybe within two months the ndr will approach you with an audit notice asking for preliminary information once you provide the preliminary information to the ndr they will again ask you another set of questions asking you more documents asking you set of questions and then uh, after a lot of to and fro your audit is concluded and you are given a clearance certificate that that is for this particular tax period it may be a monthly one or it may be a quarterly one or it may be for multiple tax periods you are receiving one notice uh so this is how the approach of ndr is and it is very important for the businesses who are in the ue as well to know that how uh, the audit is conducted what is the mindset of tax authorities when they are auditing you so as i said that the first audit notice how what the tax authority will ask you uh your basic sales and purchase template uh, similar to an fta audit file uh, what we have in ue in bahrain also the national bureau of revenue has uh, released the sales and purchase template which will be attached to your audit notice they will ask you a brief description about your business that what activities are you generally carrying so for example if you are a real estate industry i mean you are a developer they will ask you that what all activities do you conduct are you into uh, you know sale and purchase of residential commercial real estate are you also into uh, you know renting or multiple questions in terms of what are your procurements what are your uh what are your sales what are your output supply then the second question what we have generally seen in 90% of the cases they will ask you a trend analysis of your sales and purchases that what has happened in the last 15 months whether your sales are on a downward trend or they are on an upward trend if they see any major upside on your import tax credit then you are 100% prone to audit in the next coming two or three months your profit and loss your financial statement uh, your last audited financials or your management accounts are also being asked in the first audit notice your trial balance for that particular period is being asked and these are the information which are uh, you know analyzed by the ndr and 
the business or the assessee is given 5 to 7 working days to respond to the request if a business is not able to respond to the request then there are administrative fines of uh, around 5000 dinars which is 50000 dirhams the assessee has to pay and we have seen and we are levying such fine in case of non compliance uh, with the audit notice usually in the second audit notice which comes from the nbr which is a follow up notice details such as your agreement contract certificate uh, your major sales and purchase invoices uh, then you know your input tax deduction uh, how how have you claimed input tax deduction on certain expenses if you are a partially taxable business then how have you calculated the apportionment ratio how have you you know categorized the expenses into taxable exempt and then uh, you know common expenses all these details have are been asked and uh, we have seen that you know as, as a practical aspect it is there is a mistake of even one dinar uh, the the system automatically calculates the tax table the penalties which are applicable administrative penalties and it is shown as a table on the npr portal which is i believe you know similar to how what what happens at the fca portal as well so as you all can see my screen there are i mean these are just a descriptive nature of or uh, instances or descriptive nature of documents and details which are asked by the nbr uh, in few of the cases we have also seen uh, the tax authority asking for bank statements and they will also ask you to reconcile your bank statement in terms of the payables and receivables from that particular uh, for that particular tax period so let's say 100 dinar worth of sales i had made in the month of march they will say that okay this 100 dinar in how much time have you collected for let's say a person x uh, i mean company a has sold it to company x right so that company x how much time has company x x taken to you know pay it back to company a and there is also cross examination or or uh, i would say counter confirmation from the customers and suppliers as well so if i am getting audited and let's say my customer is surrender in that case the tax authorities will also go to surrender and ask that whether have you purchased anything from rishab or not so these audit confirmations or balance confirmations are also being asked by the national bureau of revenue moving on to the next slide is uh, these are few crucial points yes yes uh, you wanted to say something no 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 please yes uh so these are uh, i would say that few crucial points uh, what the ndr asked for example uh, motor vehicle the details of the motor vehicle the usage of motor vehicle uh, similarly in case of mobile phones as well uh, in case of medical insurance as well because all three expenses might have a element of personal uses as well right so we have been seeing uh, if uh, uh you know any of the businesses are uh, you know audited by the federal tax authority in ua or you know maybe in a refund situation you would know that uh, the federal tax authority in ua is specifically asking you these three expenses like so in case of motor vehicles that yes the law says that if uh, the ua vat law says that if your motor vehicle is given for personal use and is available for pers- uh, is given for business use and is available for personal use then the credit is disallowed whereas in bahrain the law says that 40% of credit you can take in case you are having a mixed usage so similar in case of similar in case of mobile phones as well uh, and in case of medical insurance as well we have seen uh, you know tax or it is dispute, disputing this particular uh, credit uh because uh, i would just like to highlight one thing that overall fully litigation mostly uh, you know in case of output taxes in terms of taxability of a transaction because 80 to 90% it is uh, the same where in claiming an input tax credit this is the first thing the tax authority see uh, i mean this is the first i second i or third i of the tax authority is that yes your input tax should be 100% correct output is something that you would have already managed it right uh, moving on to the next slide uh, is continuation for the existing topic as i said that uh, 
as you as as the chartered accountant would have read uh, the income tax act 1961 in india and there was section 144 which was my favorite section at that time when i was studying and i used to see that which used to say about the best judgment assessment that in case there is no uh, data available with the tax authorities you they will uh, you know uh, basis their best judgment they will calculate your taxes even in case of uh, vat um, i mean in this talking about this particular region the tax authorities do have that power to best judge your uh, uh, you know uh, best judge your sales and purchases based is the trial balance and bank account which you provide to them so the tax authorities can go to any extent uh, to to assess your tax payable and uh, based is their best judgment they can just send you a notice that this is how uh, you know we have calculated uh your sales and this is how we have calculated your purchases this is your trial balance and bank statement and this much is the vat which you have to pay and around 5 to 10 days are being given uh, to the to the business to settle the deal uh if you have any questions in terms of uh, this tax audit part uh, please post it in the q and a box and i would be happy to answer that the third topic which i would like to discuss and which was uh, which is linked to the anti money uh, laundering topic which we were discussing today uh, so firstly i will touch upon the penalty and prosecution uh, provisions which are applicable as per the bahrain vat law uh, jay if you can just move to the next slide please thank you so much uh, so as you can see my screen the administrative penalties which are applicable in bahrain are four to five times more than what is there as per the uae vat law so if you fail to register the penalty is 10000 dinars which is 100000 dirhams a uh, penalty for late submission of vat return or late payment of taxes is 5 to 25% if the vat is paid within 60 days and it can extend up to 300% if it is beyond 60 days and there is an administrative fine of 5000 dinars for uh, almost any of the mistakes uh, you know any of the uh, penalties which are i mean any any of the mistakes which the business can do if you are obstructing the nbr to carry on the duties as i said that if you don't provide the information within due date uh, to the to the nbr uh, there would be a administrative penalty of 5000 dinars now if you fail to display your vat certificate fail to display prices uh there would still be a penalty of 5000 dinars right so overall if you see that 5000 is means a 50000 dirhams is a huge administrative penalty which is being levied by uh the nbr in bahrain if i can move to the next slide there are certain article 63 of the bahrain vat law specifically talks about cases of tax evasion which are these are just instances of tax evasion if you can all see the screen it can be failure to register with uh, the tax authority fraudulently recovering the input tax if you are unlawfully claiming the uh, you know the vat refund or failing to issue tax invoices if you are not a registered entity and raising a tax invoice collecting vat so tax evasion can be anything and everything there is also a prosecution which is mentioned in uh, the bahrain vat law and since the last 2 years and 3 months uh, we as tax consultants have been seeing a lot of businesses being fined but prosecution was not happening till now because 2019 uh, like uh, 2019 was the year of implementation and bahrain had also adopted a staggered vat implementation uh, where in 1st january 2019 1st july 2019 and then 1st january 2020 there were three dates of implementation this is uh, each business is turnover right now that 2020 all went uh, due to the you know, this corona virus crisis it all went 2021 is the year where uh, major changes are happening in the tax authority in bahrain uh, so they have set up uh, the proper litigation structure uh, and uh, you know they have uh, jeff you can just move to the next slide please so this is why we were discussing this penalty and uh, prosecution that recently this tax evasion crime unit was set up in the month of february by the attorney general which is affiliated which is an independent unit but 
which will be affiliated with the financial crimes and money laundering prosecution which will take care of all the crimes which are stipulated in the value added tax law uh, of barring of 2018 so as you saw in my previous slide article 63 there are seven cases of tax evasion so if the tax authority see that a business is a business has conducted a serious tax evasion crime then the tax authority will the ndr will definitely refer the case to the tax evasion crime unit and tax evasion crime unit will take its own due course of action now why is it important for ua and specifically for abu dhabi businesses is that last year in november 2020 a similar court was established uh, for money laundering and evasion and which is only specific to businesses who are registered in abu dhabi so uh, while we were discussing uh, uh, you know about tax evasion crime unit businesses in abu dhabi also have a similar uh, kind of court which will deal with the tax evasion cases and which is part of the uh, abu dhabi judicial department of course uh, while we talk about our other emirates uh, there is no specific court which is set up uh, but yes uh, it will it will form part of their own you know it's a federal crime and it will form part of their own judicial system as per the other emirates uh, moving on to next uh so this is all uh, from my side uh, gentlemen and if you have any uh, query related to bahrain vat law uh, please free to post it in the q and a uh, chat box i would just allow my colleague jay to take over on to give an overview of the oman vat since it is Wait. a burning topic as of now yes uh, i would suggest uh, rishab sorry for uh, intervening uh, jay uh, i would uh, say let anas to a case yeah. Uh, because I wanted a case, say, then uh, Bahrain and Oman because of the sequence of it. There's a lot of learnings from case, say, which definitely uh, will be uh, important. And Oman is following all the countries is what I wanted to reflect in the JS presentation. So apologies for all the uh, uh, disconnect which happened with the laptop. Anas, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarandar. And I'm really sorry for the inconvenience that happened. But I mean, with Corona and and COVID, like this is technologies. Like sometimes it fails us, right? <laughs> okay, great. So so going back to um, what was what I was mentioning, like before um, I got the cutoff. Um, so as as you know, like there is a couple of taxes um, in KSA, or like let's say different types of taxes which are applied in KSA. Now, as internationally happening over the world. There is like the direct tax and the indirect tax section where direct tax is mainly on the income that the company makes and indirect tax is mainly like on the consumption or on goods or like healthy products uh, or to introduce more healthier, um, let's say, uh, kind of transactions within the country. So as you can see, like from a direct tax perspective, there is the Zakalivai, which is um, applied mainly for Saudis and GCC nationals. And there is the income tax, which includes the corporate income tax, withholding tax, and capital gains tax. Um, and we're going to go into, into like some details uh, about each and every type of taxes here. And like the other side of it, which is the indirect tax, we have like value added tax, which is very common in the GCC um, countries. There is the excise tax also, which is also common. Now, what KSA has introduced recently is the real estate transaction tax. And that applies to real estate transactions specifically, which I think is a new introduction to the region and was not there before. In addition to that, there's the customs, which is the common customs law between GCC countries. And it's governed also by the economic GCC agreement um, between the GCC countries. So going on to the um, next slide, uh, we're gonna speak more into the details now of each uh, type of taxes, which we have mentioned in the first slide. So starting with the Zaka, uh, as I mentioned, this applies to Saudi and GCC nationals mainly, or companies who are owned by Saudi or GCC nationals. Now, for sure, there is a lot of companies which are beneficially owned by someone else, like it's in form owned by a GCC national. However, there is a beneficial ownership on by a side agreement or let's say a kind of um, like trust arrangement or something like that, which governs the um, relationship between the owners uh, and form and legal owners of the company and the beneficial owners of the company. Now that's like um, a topic which we can give a full seminar on, 
um, due to the like, but due to the time, I think we're gonna just address that at this time and tell you that, okay, if you have this kind of trust arrangement, you're under exposure and you need to uh, speak to your consultant about this in order to cover this exposure for future circumstances. Now, as you can see, like the Zakah Levi is 2.5%, which is applied on the Zakah base. Now, um, the Zakah base is the higher of the company's net worth or the net adjusted income of the company uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, for, from a compliance perspective, like all taxpayers and Zakah payers are required to submit their tax return within 20, 120 days from the, date, uh, from the uh, year end. And there's also the payment which should be done uh, at the same day. Um, so going on to the next slide, we're gonna look at the zakah, uh, sorry, on the tax aspects. So the tax, as, as you might be aware, it applies to foreign shareholders, which are non-GCC or non-KSA uh, shareholders of a companies in, in Saudi Arabia. Now there is one specific thing that we need to address here and to differentiate between who's subject to tax and who's subject to zakah when it comes specifically to branches. So when we speak about branches, um, as you can see here, an unresident conducting business in KSA through a permanent establishment is a taxable person. Now a branch for the tax purposes is considered uh, as a permanent establishment and hence it will be subject to tax. Now there is like a lot of uh, contradiction, I, I would say, between the zakah law and the income tax law, where also the zakah law has mentioned um, that the branch, if its central management is inside KSA and it's owned by GCC shareholders, then it would be subject to zakah. Now, this is a clear contradiction between the income tax law and the zakah regulations, but looking at the hierarchy of laws, so the law is a higher rank of the uh, regulations and hence the income tax law applies, uh, not just not the uh, zakah regulations in these circumstances. So in addition to that, like there is the draft zakah laws, which mentioned also an article which says that whatever is contradicting between the zakah law and the tax law, the tax law prevails. So that's an additional thing that needs to be into consideration. Um, so again, like this is the taxable persons. Um, just the last thing, last point here is the companies who are engaged in oil and hydrocarbon materials. Now, these companies are subject to tax based on their capital investment. The tax rate would change based on the capital investment that you have made in KSA. So going on to the next slide, um, this is more about the permanent establishment. What is a permanent establishment? Now, the word seems like a legal entity. However, a permanent establishment is a tax entity. Even if you don't have a tax presence or if you don't have a legal presence in KSA, then you might have a tax presence through employees or through having like an office or um, like through having an agent in KSA. So these things would expose you to have a permanent establishment in KSA, which is a tax entity uh, for the non-resident doing business through a fixed place in KSA. Now, as you can see, like a lot of companies also in practice, we have seen a lot of companies who have collection agents in KSA, who have like agents doing business on their behalf in KSA. Now, there is a differentiation on which agent should be, should be considered as a permanent establishment. And these, as you can see, like here on the right side, <clears throat> these are the condition for an agent to be considered as a permanent establishment in KSA. So um, moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> so as you can see here, these are the timelines which we believe are important for you to know um, on a general like uh, high level, we can say. So the taxpayer, as we mentioned, should submit their tax return within 120 days from the date of the financial year end. Now, the, uh, once you have make, submitted your tax return, also the payment should be within the same period and it shouldn't be exceeded because if you failed to pay, then you fail to submit your tax return and you will be subject to the penalties by the tax authority. Now, as you can see also, there's like the five years, five years. Now, uh, the statutory or like, we call it the statute of limitation for the tax authority to audit your books and to um, check whether you have submitted correct tax returns or not is five years. Now, if there was any kind of a fraud or any kind of evasion, which the company has made, then this is where the tax authority can extend the five years to be 10 years. So this is where uh, you need to be careful. The submissions should be made at time. Uh, make sure that you're not like submitting any fraudulent documents and 
all the information are submitted properly to the tax authority to avoid this kind of extension of the five years. So moving on to the, um, to the next slide, um, there is also the withholding tax concept. Now, I think a lot of people would have questions about withholding tax and how it applies and to whom it applies. Now, there is three main conditions for the withholding tax. Now, I can, uh, through this illustration, like we can put these through uh, three conditions that I've mentioned. Um, so there should be a payment this is the first condition, there should be a payment. So an accrual by itself would not trigger withholding tax. So there should be a payment from a resident company to a non-resident company. So this is the second condition that the payment should be like done. And the second thing that the um, resident should pay to a non-resident. And the third one, which is a payment from a source in KSA. So this payment should be a source from KSA. Now, a source like a source from KSA doesn't mean that just the payment is starting from KSA and going to UAE. No, not, not that concept. Rather than um, under like one of the articles in the income tax law, which is specifically Article 5, in the tax law and the tax regulations, there is a set of sources or sets of incomes that are considered sourced from KSA. So as an example, like technical consulting services is considered sourced from KSA if provided to a resident in KSA or related to a project in KSA. So sometimes like it might be your head office making the payment on your behalf in UAE, let's assume, and to a consulting firm. However, you are the person who are benefiting from the service. So this kind of transaction would be subject to taxes in KSA if there is a payment which happened and if the services are provided to the resident, which means that actually the place of doing the payment is not relevant in this case. So um, as, as you can see, like the withholding tax rates would range between five to 20, uh, 20%. Now this is on the gross payment made to the non-resident. Um, you will deduct like 5% or 15% or 20% depending on the uh, nature of the services or the nature of the source of income, which was, which was generated inside KSA. Now the submission or the compliances for the withholding tax. As a company, you need to submit your withholding tax form within 10 days from the day uh, or from the month following the month of the payment. So assumably if you paid an amount in January, whatever day you, you pay in January, you have 10 days within February in order to submit your withholding tax return. However, um, like the penalties will not start accumulating until like 30 days passes from the 10 days uh, from the due date of the submission of the withholding tax. Now, um, the last compliance requirement for, from a withholding tax perspective is the annual withholding tax form, which should be submitted with the tax return, which is within 120 days from the financial year end. So now going to the second type of tax um, or the second category of tax, I would say in KSA, which is the indirect taxes. As you can see, like we're, we're gonna speak here about the VAT excise tax, the real estate transaction tax and the customs duties. So um, on the value added tax, um, uh, like mainly the value added tax, as everyone knows, it applies and it's applicable to the supply of goods and services um, and like from an economic activity within the country. Um, and sometimes also it depends like if there is a transactions, cross-border transactions, depending on the rules and regulations, um, these kind of transactions might sometimes be uh, like VAT might sometimes apply to this. Now, as you can see the applicable rates in KSA, um, there is the standard rate, which is 15%, zero rate exempt and out of scope. As, as my colleague Rishab mentioned earlier, um, the differences between what is a zero rated and what is an exempt transaction and the out of scope, which are like done or not supplied within the country mainly. Um, in addition, like there is also as a kind of example for the out of scope service, uh, uh, like out of scope transactions, which are not uh, where VAT is not applicable to, is the uh, transfer of business. So transfer of business also uh, under the VAT laws are considered sometimes as out of scope, depending if it meets the conditions. Now, the from a compliance perspective, um, like there is a quarterly submission that should be made if the revenues of the company are below 40 million, and if the um, revenues or the annual turnover of the company exceeds 40 million, then you should submit your VAT returns on a monthly basis. So moving on to the, um, to the next slide. 
there was like recently, as, as you can see, there was recently a change, um, like recently, I would say within the past year. Um, so a change in the VAT rate uh, from a 5% rate, which was like regular with all the GCC countries to a 15% rate uh, where the tax authority, uh, we assume that the government here took this approach in order to avoid or in order to enhance its financial position uh, after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, this, uh, this resolution was issued by 11th of May, 2020. Like the application starts from uh, 1st of July, 2020. Now, why 11th of May is, is an important date because um, as per the transitional provisions, um, there is supplies with, or there is contracts which were signed before 11th of May and there is contracts which were signed after 11th of May. And I think this date is the, um, the date that should be considered um, like for the transitional provisions in order to apply uh, on, on the contracts properly. Uh, now, how would this affect you as a company? You need to consider like the contracts, you need to consider the action points that um, like the contracts that you have, whether you can change these, like the, the prices that you have or not, uh, whether these transitional provisions applies to you or not, the types of services that you're providing, the IT systems that you have. So all of these considerations should be made when the uh, VAT rate has changed. So moving on to the, um, to the next slide. Now there is the excise tax, which as I mentioned, like normally countries or internationally, they apply these kind of excise tax taxes to reduce the bad habit, habits of their, um, like of the, of, of the people in the country, of the citizens mainly. Um, so as you can see, like there is uh, two rates for the excise tax, which is 100% and the 50%, the 100% is applied on the, let's say, um, the very bad habits, I would call it, which is the tobacco products, the energy drinks, and the electric, uh, electric smoking devices. Now, the 50% is the on, on the lower kind of um, habits that, that the citizens would have, which is the soft drinks and the sweetened drinks. Now, again, this is a consumption tax. It applies on consumption. Uh, mainly what you need to do to know about VAT and excise tax that if these taxes are affecting your company or you're affecting your financial position as a business, then there might be a kind of a leakage uh, with the way that you're applying the VAT or the excise tax. Because in concept, the VAT and excise tax should not affect you as a business. It should be like ultimately paid by the consumer, which is the people who are using these kind of products. So as you can see, like for the excise tax, the reporting period is like two months and um, like the, the due date for the submission of the uh, like excise tax return would be 15 days from the end of the tax period, which is again, the two months uh, which were provided and the payment should be made within the same time. So uh, moving on to the next slide. We're going to talk like a little bit about the real, uh, real estate transaction tax. Again, uh, due to the um, time limits that we have, real estate transaction tax also can be like we can do a full seminar on that in order to give what is exempt, what is not exempt, what does uh, what is included on the real transaction tax, how does it affect like the VAT, from which perspectives, like if you paid VAT already, what should you do now um, since like VAT, it, this is considered again as an exempt VAT transaction and how this would affect companies. Now, real estate transaction tax, it mainly applies um, to the real estate transactions which happen. So if you're selling a building, if you're selling a land, like these kind of things, um, it will apply like at a 5% rate. Now, some people would say that real transaction tax has benefited us and it reduced the VAT rate. But I would say on the long run, the real estate transaction tax might be more harmful. Like it will, it will do the inflations uh, in the real estate transactions, which would affect generally the businesses and it would affect, like it will affect the whole economy by doing an inflation in the real estate prices uh, in the future. So again, like it's beneficial at a short term, but on a long-term basis, because this is more of an accumulative taxes that you're paying. So it doesn't, you cannot deduct what you have paid previously, which is similar to that. Um, now this was introduced on 4th of October, 2020. And uh, again, from that day, um, VAT was considered as exempt, like these transactions were considered exempt from VAT. 
and the real estate tax came in. <clears throat> okay, so um, moving on like the customs duty, um, this is like, I think more of a kind of general on the whole GCC countries uh, where any imports um, that you do from outside the country uh, should be subject or might be subject to 5% to up to 20% 20, uh, 20 and sometimes like it even goes beyond that like 25% or 27% uh, for the customs duty. Now what you need to know about the customs is whenever there is an imports which are happening between the GCC countries there is the GCC um, customs economy uh, sorry the GCC economic agreement which might give some reliefs from the customs duty, depending on certain conditions. In addition to that, like there is the GAFTA uh, agreement, which is between the Arab countries. There is the IFTA agreement, which is with a couple of the Euro European countries. And there is like several kind of international trade agreements, uh, which might be beneficial to the companies to consider before stepping into um, the payment of the customs or before even importing these equipments to the KSA. So moving on um, to the next slide, we're, we're gonna get now talk about um, one of the most hot topics in KSA, especially that there is a lot of audits happening, a lot of uh, assessments which are happening to the companies in KSA. So there is the procedure with the general secretariat or let's say the litigation procedure in general um, and how it should move on in KSA. Now, as you can see, like the first step is the tax authorities issuing the assessment. Now, as you know now, or as some of you have seen in, in practice, there is always an initial assessment issued before the GAST assessment, and they give you five days in order to give them supporting documents to change their mind. So that's not the assessment that you need to object on, but there is like the assessment that, that you receive a notification, official notification from the tax authority system saying that this is your tax amount or tax due, which you have to pay in KSA. Now, from the date of receiving that assessment, you have to calculate 60, day, 60 days, including the day that you received the assessment. So if you received an assessment, let's assume at 10th of February, 10th of February is counted within the 60 days. Um, and, and within these 60 days, you have to submit an objection to the tax authority. Um, there is for sure, like you need to consider the formalities of this objection and how it should be submitted to the tax authority with the proper supporting document for that. Now, after you submit your objection within the 60 days, the tax authority would have 90 days uh, in order to respond to you. Now, if they didn't respond to you, that means like an, an rejection from the tax authority. And if you receive the response also, like whether it's an acceptance or a rejection, you need to consider whether you need to proceed with an objection or not on that uh, response from the tax authority. Now, uh, once you receive this response or once the 90 days passes, then you have 30 days from that day to even go to the settlement committee, which is called the Alternative Dispute Resolution Committee, or you can go directly uh, and escalate it to the General Secretariat of the Tax Committees, which is again the Tax Dispute Resolution Committees. So if you go with the settlement committee, then the settlement committee also has a different kind of procedure they have to respond to you within 30 days. If they didn't respond uh, with an approval or rejection, then that's considered uh, by itself a, a rejection. Now on the settlement committee, um, there is a procedure of around like, it takes from 120 days up to 180 days. Um, and, and in case it was not finalized within this also uh, timeline, then also that will be considered like as a kind of rejection and you need to progress uh, within 30 days from the date of that rejection or the passage of the time to the uh, General Secretariat of the Tax Committees. Now, the as you can see, escalated to CTVDR. <clears throat> this is the name of the committee, which is the Committee for Tax Violation and Dispute Resolution. This is um, like as a kind of fact, we call it the first instance committee, where this is the first stage of the tax courts in KSA. If you got like, once you submit your objection to this uh, committee, <clears throat> and they issue their decision. Once they issue the, their decision uh, with, with acceptance, then you're fine, you're happy. If it, it was issued with rejections, um, then you have like 30 days to submit an objection to the Appeal Committee for Tax Violation and Dispute Resolution, which again is the final stage of appeal uh, or objection from a tax perspective. And there is no other stages 
um, to go beyond that if you got a rejection. So moving on to the next slide. <coughs> As you can see, like there is, um, as I mentioned, like the formalities are really important when it comes to taxes and when it comes to objections. And this is where most of the people would miss um, their objection or will, will lose their uh, objection because of simple formality, which was not completed and you would not have the right to object on the tax authorities assessment anymore. And you have to pay the taxes. Now, just as a kind of a background, um, the current registered cases with the with the general secretariat for tax committees is around like 40,000 case. I would say um, like part of that, like there is responses that was issued and there is like decisions which were made, which were around like 2000 cases up to the latest uh, statistics that the GSTC made. 58% of these cases were rejected due to formalities. So unless you know 100% how to submit an objection, or what is the formalities required and what is required to be mentioned in your objection, then I would, I would request you to go to an advisor who is an expert with this, uh, who will assist you to know how you need to submit your objection. So as you can see like here, there's the case filing requirements. These are kind of set standards that you have to um, submit. Now, um, generally when you submit your case, you would receive a, a notification requesting information um, from you and additional information within 15 days, you have to submit this additional information request. Otherwise, the tag, like the GSTC will consider your case as non-existent. And that means that as if you did not submit your objection, as if you did not do anything and the tax authority has the right to execute the tax assessment and collect uh, and claim the amounts from there. So moving on to the next slide, this is the uh, objection appeal process, as we have mentioned earlier. Um, first thing is the case which, uh, should be filed by the claimant. Now this is the like procedure within the GSTC, within the tax courts. So once you submit your case, you will receive uh, um, the notification um, from the GSTC. And then after, like, after that, um, you will receive a notification, which is the case number. And then after that, the other party, which is the tax authority mainly, will receive a notification also saying that this taxpayer has objected on your assessment within this details. Now, the tax authority, which is the defendant here, should submit the response um, like to the tax committees. And you will receive a notification with this response. You can read it and respond back to it um, within like a certain time limit that the GSTC will give to you. Now, again, once you um, do the submission, the GSTC or the tax committees will set a hearing date. And within like uh, mainly like you will receive that within two months, three months, and sometimes like it takes longer. But the minimum we've seen like is two months and it goes beyond. So after setting the hearing session date, now it's very important that you receive all the notifications because if you miss the notification, the GSTC or the tax committees will consider that the notification has been received unless you prove otherwise, which is difficult to prove because the system will say that you received the notification on the phone number or the email. So you need to be careful with this point specifically in order to avoid um, any kind of problems um, with, the, with the tax authorities or the GSTC. Again, after that, there is the verbal uh, decision like will be issued within 30 days or 60 days from that ver verbal decision, you should receive um, the official decision with the reasoning and all the details that the uh, tax dispute committee has resol resolved the case with. And then the same case or the same scenario, once you receive the decision, you need to object and like the cycle goes on similarly for the Appeal Committee for Tax Violation and Dispute Resolution. So moving on to the next slide, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have the time already, um, but because yeah, these I'm, are like... Yeah, I, was, I can see a message from Mr. Neeraj uh, in terms of time. Just see uh, what you can do uh, in terms of uh, coverage. Uh, maybe we will... Uh, how many more slides are there? Three, I think. I think this is like two slides left. If yeah, I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah, now I'm just going to wrap up with this slide. Um, I think this is the, the important thing. And the last one is a bit repetitive. So we can keep it um, like for the people to read it because it's very informative there. So the, the last point which I want to mention here is you have to always commit with the days. Like as you can see, if you want to sus suspend your case, you have 180 days. 
So there is always a time clocking and there is always um, like timelines which should be set. And this is where um, like you as, as a person who's a financial person, who's doing these taxes, you need to be sure that you meet this, these deadlines or otherwise like the whole claim that you have made or have a case that will be disregarded and dismissed. So I think we can we can um, like wrap up with this with this slide um, surrender and we can go maybe to Oman if we still have um, time to to go with that. Yeah, now we will travel to Oman. Uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, distance now. With the exactly. <laughs> uh, Jay, all yours, uh, please. Thank you, Anas. Yeah. yeah. So in March 2017, most of the people were having believed that VAT will not come in GCC. It cannot sustain. Now, three years down the line, Oman is going to be the fourth country who is introducing the VAT. So since it's the fourth country, it's the blend of all the things. Some portion from KSA, some portion from Bahrain, UAE and top of the same customization. So that's why it's very important for us especially in the current pandemic, that we protect ourselves from all the regulations, maybe AML, maybe VAT, corporate tax, uh, withholding tax. The main agenda of why we all are having this meeting at 9 a.m., 9 p.m., to protect ourselves. So with this, I'll take you to the roller coaster ride of two minutes to quickly highlight you that Oman is different. It's not same like UAE, KSA, and Bahrain. There are key provisions which we need to understand to protect ourselves. So there are 11 items which are zero rated, seven which are exempt, and five which are out of scope. Now the unique provision in Oman, healthcare and zero rated are exempt. In none of the GCC country, it is exempt. It's a major change. Healthcare institutions, education institutions, they cannot claim VAT. All the cost on their construction day to day, it becomes a cost to them. It's a unique provision. Similarly, sale of first residential real estate, it's 5%. In none of the GCC countries, it's the same provision. Further, if you are renting, even from the first rental agreement, the residential rent is exempt. So if you will construct a building, instead of selling, you will lease it out. Construction cost, that on the construction is a cost to you. So in this way, it's entirely different. Businesses understood it from the day of the registration itself. They were thinking that, okay, we will handle it in-house. We have done three countries. It's nothing new for us. But the moment VAT law was introduced and the executive regulations were introduced last week, people now have felt that how much new work is involved and hardly 20 days are left to implement. Another change, sovereign activities. In other GCC, it's out of scope. But in Oman, the law is silent. Whenever the law is silent on any provision, it directly goes into standard rate. Four limits, like Oman, every person has to register based on turnover, but we recommend register voluntary. Don't wait for the tide to come. Prepare yourself early. Start claiming input tax from day one. Key learnings, as I mentioned from the registration itself, the people understood Oman is not same. The entire registration portal is linked with your company registration, commercial registration, MOCI. All the details are pulled in from there. If you are not, a, if authorized signatory, you cannot register yourself. Many companies were not having even credentials. They were relying on their tax consultant, corporate tax consultant. They found, found it challenged to even log in into the portal, leave about the registration. That's how the Oman was is entirely change, uh, different compared to UAE, Bahrain in terms of procedures and the implementation method. Since we have only 20 days left, I would just like to quickly highlight quick tips which business should must do. Other things being aside, these are the key bare minimum things. First things, you should check your contracts. Are they having text clause as exclusive? If no, Speak with your customer tomorrow itself, I would say, make it the term exclusive. Otherwise, you are going to have a 5% hit. 
have you entered are there any agents based in oman then you need to have a agreement with them register with the tax authorities otherwise your agent cannot work on your behalf analyze can you form a tax group to save the cash flow cash is the king especially in the current scenario try to uh, find the alternatives where you can save the cash by forming a tax group or streamlining your operations consider related party transactions impact on deem supplies these are the quick tips which i would like to just give in in the interest of time and the best way to be 100% compliant is to have a person on board who has seen all the journey who understands business as well as who understands the other law and the uniqueness is oman don't try and test by yourself as we are seeing the compliances are changing day by day may it be anti money laundering esr ubo or vat as a business you should have someone on your board so that you can protect you can be responsible to your management and sustain your business in long run rather than paying hefty penalties in the future so the cost of compliance is prevention is always less than the cure so with this i would like to end my ses uh, session go live date is 16th april executive regulations were released last week 20 days time is very less but sufficient if you have a good advisor on the board who can take you the quick ride and can enable you to be ready within 20 days so with this uh, i would hand over to the icit team thank you thank, thank you cj so what a wonderful you know uh, insightful session on the gcc uh, vat and uh, tax updates uh, thank you team mmjs uh, for sharing this knowledge and uh, as uh, cs surender mentioned at the beginning that uh, vat is getting older but the vat audit and the litigation is is new and it was interesting to know that you know uh, uh, ksa has a tax system from 1950 so uh, moving to the q and a session i think in the interest of time we won't be able to take much of question so i'll just take uh, one or two question uh, hmm. for ksa vat is it allowed to take a uh, vat credit for the vat paid on medical insurance for the employees and their dependents yes okay so so now on on this specific question um i mean like there might be some kind of complexity on answering it like live now um because now whether the employees and and you know like in the case a law it is required by the law to have like an insurance for the people who have residency on the company or uh, the dependents of the employees so now for employees this this is considered like as a kind of a compulsory expense for them and that would be fine now when it comes to dependents this is where the complication come on whether this is required because it's required by the law is it like a kind of a personal expense that the company is paying on behalf of their employee or not so again like in in general and in perspective let's say in theoretically um this is part of the company's expense as, as long as it's the uh, under the contract of the employee that they will provide the employee with the insurance for him and for his dependents now if this is not under the employment contract then there will be a kind of a challenge from the tax from the tax authority if the company is paying this kind of um insurance coverage on behalf of their Uh, employee and collecting this VAT. So again, like uh, the the main purpose or the main thing that you need to consider whether this is a, a business expense or it's not a business expense, and based on that you can build um, like the challenge and the arguments with the tax authority. Okay, thank you. Uh, since a lot of companies are going through probably the you know assessment process, uh, is there any timeline to submit the information requested by the tax tax officer in the regulation? or is it at the discretion of the tax officer because i mean many time uh, you know the, the request come that uh, that the information has to be submitted within 5 days but sometime they ask to submit the information on the same date yes now under under the vat regulations there is a specific timeline which is 20 days that you need to submit the information with however for income tax purposes there is no set um standard for that however again the tax authority uses the 5 days or uses 20 days to pressure the companies and in case you don't submit they will say it's not non cooperation with the tax authorities now and sometimes in case, again go in ahead, case sorry. of VA, in case of vat how about the subsequent request coming from the tax authorities even for the subsequent so mainly request, like it's, or 
Yes, now it's it's a 20 days, um, like for providing all the information. This is what the law mentioned. And it's within, like it didn't go into any specific circumstances for additional requests. So mainly you will see the tax authority first request, you will have 20 days, and then they will, for any additional request, they will give you five days or sometimes even they will tell you we need it today, just submit it. Okay. Because okay. they consider, unfortunately, it's a click of a button. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Anas. Uh, so without uh, taking much of time, I'll just uh, uh, hand over the proceeding to our Vice Chairman, John George. John, over to you. Thank you, uh, CA Rohit. Uh, um, um, it's my honor and privilege to propose a word of thanks on behalf of the chapter for today's webinar on UAE anti-money laundering and GCC VAT update. Today's seminar was engaging and informative. I'm sure that all members attended today have enhanced the knowledge on UAE anti-money laundering and GCC VAT. I'd like to thank C. Atul Kumar Gupta, past president of ICAI, we thank you, sir, for being our chief guest today. I take this opportunity to thank Ms. Safiya Hashim Al Safi, Director of Anti Money Laundering Department and Monitoring with Ministry of Economy. Thank you so much, madam, for taking time for addressing our members. I also thank Mr. Narasimha Das, Associate Partner at Grove, for your presentation on. AML. The presentation was very informative and surely our members will benefit from this. We had a great session on GCC VAT. Thank you, CA Surendra Jasrani, CEO and Managing Director at MMJS Consulting. Thank you. I thank his team, Mr. Anas, Mr. Rishabh, and Mr. Jay Duseja for their wonderful presentation. And uh, the subject is really vast. I think we need to have more uh, interaction on this GCC VAC because it's a very wide subject. It's differ from country to country. I also thank our uh, Abu Dhabi chapter committee members for their support for making this event uh, successful. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our sponsors I wish to express my gratitude to all participants. I hope it was a great learning for all of us. Thank you for being with us this evening. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. John, I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone. everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.